My name is Jana Butner. I'm a figurative sculptor focusing on sculpting from life, the human figure. And in my spare time, I like to spend a lot of time in nature and hiking outside. I'm Chris Stafford, and you're listening to Art, the podcast where we get to know women from around the world of visual arts. This is Season 2, Episode 4. My guest this week is Jana Butner, a figure shift sculptor who focuses on sculpting from life from her studios in Salzburg and Florence. Jana was born in Salzburg in 1997 and has what she describes as three half-siblings. Her mother Petra, an art teacher, is from Prague, and her father Uwe is from Dortmund. She grew up in an artistic and musical family, learning violin and piano, and visiting museums and galleries around Europe. From 2008 to 2012, Jana studied at the Musicius Gymnasium in Salzburg, where she was exposed to music, dancing, literature, and fine art. After graduating, she decided to spend a year in New Zealand, which helped her clarify her career goals. When she was 19, she was accepted at the prestigious Florence Academy of Art, where she spent three years studying under multiple instructors, including the founder of the sculpting program, Robert Bowden. Jana has won numerous awards and shown in exhibitions and permanent collections around Europe and the U.S., including FACE 2021, the Society of Portrait Sculptors at La Galleria Palmal in London, and the Espaço Exhibitionista Gallery in Lisbon, Portugal, as well as the Figurativas in Barcelona. She says her goal is to provoke emotions and encourage empathy in the viewer. The viewer, she says, should be engaged by the work so they can identify themselves within it. Jana, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me all the way from Salzburg. Hello, thank you for having me. So first of all, let's establish your location because you work from two beautiful locations, Salzburg and Florence. So right now we're recording whilst you're in Salzburg. So you have a studio in both places. Yeah, I have uh, one main studio in Florence, which is like a little bit bigger and a little bit more made for working with models and all the main things. And then I have another smaller studio here in Salzburg where I occasionally do some like casting or I take some small commissions here and there, which then I finish in that studio as well. So I'm kind of bouncing back and forth um, since uh, about a year and a half um, between yeah, Salzburg and Florence. I'm very envious right now, Jana. Being a European, I do miss all that the, in the culture. I also noted earlier when we were talking that you said, your sculptors have been to more places in the world than you have so far. So far, there's still plenty of time. I'm sure you will catch up with them. But do you know which countries your sculptors currently are? Oh, it's a uh, it's a mix of um, multiple ones. Of course, most of my sculptures are um, in Germany and Florence, just because I made them there and I have all my copies there. But then, of course, when it comes to um, galleries or museums or clients, they're um, all over the place. They're in Dubai, they're in Spain, in France, in the States. Um, so New York, Boston, like all different places. And as we talked before, I haven't made it over to the States yet, which I hope I will catch up soon on. Um, but yeah, so they're kind of traveled. Yeah. More than I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. And we should explain. You know, your heritage, too, because you have a very interesting background. Your, your mother's from Prague and your father's from Germany. Tell us a little bit about your family background. Yeah, so um, my mom, exactly, she's from Prague, and my, my family has um, this funny, it, it repeats itself in history. My grandpa is German and my, my grandma um, was Czech as well, so it's kind of like matched up, and then my mom was Czech again, and then my dad is German again. I think I'll probably break this, because so far um, I haven't met a Czech guy who I can continue this era with. But um, so, yeah, like um, that's kind of like um, how it's... Yeah, how it's been for a while. And like my dad still lives in Germany and my, my grandpa also lives in um, Czech Republic still. And he comes to visit here and there. Uh, we go over there as well because we have like a small cottage in the woods, which hasn't had any kind of electricity past like 
in the past 10 years we had to because my grandparents got older, but it's like this kind of hut where you go and escape in nature and there's nothing um, really, like there wasn't even running water since a while ago. Um, so yeah, there's still a really wonderful place we go to in the summer as well, because like in history in Czech Republic, like you weren't um, allowed to leave the country very much in the communist time. So it's actually really um, a common thing that many families and many um yeah many people there have this kind of like um cottage in the woods um they could go for then um on their holidays so yeah yeah and where is your your mum petra where does she live she lives in germany now but really close to the border as well so she lives literally five minutes from salzburg and my my dad lives um also in salzburg so um still very very like close, close to the border. So when people ask where I'm from, I usually go more for Austria because it's so close to the border that also I went to school. I spent most of my life actually in Austria just because all my schools were there as well. So there's just a train line, which within 10 minutes you're, you're in Salzburg. So, um, yeah, I've been border hopping a lot. Um, <laughs> which is easy to do in Europe. Yeah, yeah, super easy, super easy <laughs> compared were, to the States. <laughs> exactly. And now you were born in Salzburg then. Yeah, yeah. And you have an interesting group of siblings, shall we say. I think you told me three and a half. So explain your yeah. your family network there. Patch, patchwork family. Um, so my my dad on my dad's side um he already was married be before he met my mum and so he already had um three children from the previous marriage but um unfortunately we never really grew up together because they are more northern of germany and they were quite far away so i was more raised as an only child just because of the distance and we saw each other for christmas and all kinds of holidays but it's not been like this daily exchange of um having siblings around and they're quite a bit older than me. Um, there's kind of like a 10 year gap on the max. Um, but now they're actually moving. Two of them are like one has already moved closer to where in Salzburg we live now with um, her daughter now. So I have actually two nieces now too. Um, from my brother's side and from my half, like half brother, half sister side. And yeah, so um They've like the relationship has always been actually really nice, which I think it's it's really good to have. Um, and yeah, so that's that's um, where that is coming in. That's a, a snapshot. Now I know you have some artistic uh, background in your family, but where did the sculpting come from for you, Jana? Where, where, where was the origins of that and the and the early interest? Well, this is always the question, which is like, I should be like by now routine to answer this, but, um, it's kind of, yeah, I have not fully, fully figured it out where exactly sculpture came from. Like I've been always very um, interested and I think it was more like also raised in a, in a way that we always supported art a lot. Or my mom was always the one who was going to museums with me. She played the violin as well. So I learned as a small child as well to play the violin. And then I wanted to learn piano and I danced ballet and step dance. And so I was really, really lucky to be brought up in a place where art has been always really supported. Um, and then I think like when we went to museums, of course you admire the art. And as a child, of course, I was blown away by the, by the works, but I think society never really tells you, Oh, but you can do this as a job as well. Like you can earn some money with this. Like it just, it's nothing which um, I think is like the immediate thing. Oh, you can be an artist. Like it's not on the job offer right away. Um, so for me, that was always um, something I knew was nice. And I was always creating like artworks as well. Cause we went to like river beds and we got our own clay. And then I was making like little figurines with, like dragons and lions and these kind of things. Um, and we went on holidays and got our own pigments and in France and then made our own paint and painted with it. So my mom has always been really creative with that. And also she's been giving like classes for children, um, how to like, just explore any kind of creativity combined with like music or just yeah different materials. So it came through that, but I think I didn't know that I would pursue this as a career actually until I was. <sighs> 
17, 16, 17. Um, although I went to a school which was focusing on sculpting, but I feel like at that time I was not a hundred percent sure if I found the right material because that school was also in Austria and the school was focused very much on wood carving and stone carving. So the four years were mainly carving in wood. And then in the last year, we kind of touched clay and figurative work. And when I started to do that, I was sure that I want to explore that field further. I kind of like, yeah, I found my language in art. Um, so yeah, but that just happened actually quite late. And while I was at the sculpting school, I enjoyed all of it, but I think it was just maybe not the right material I found com like most comfortable in to express myself. And also it might have not been the right subject because um, I think in the arts nowadays, it's not the most common path well, it's getting, I think, more popular again, but it's not the most common path that you go into figurative realism um, from the beginning. Um, all the univer art universities are um, a little bit more modern, I would say. Um, so, yeah, until I found that, I think I wasn't really it wasn't really clear for me that I will will turn out to be a sculptor. But for me, the three dimensions always were kind of the thing where I was like, OK, this really captures like it has a different way of, yeah, like filling the room, which of course three-dimensional work has automatically. And I, I also like drawing and, and painting, but I've never done it in a classical professional way. But of course, when I went to an art school, we touched on that too, but I've always felt like um, there's a different presence with sculpture and has a different way to capture the viewer than um, painting for me. Although I have to say, in museums, I was mainly drawn to paintings, which is kind of like counter arguing what I said, but it's like, it's, it's, it's funny for me to create. It was always clear it's going to be sculpture. Like there was never a question to, um, to that. But then when I went to museums, of course, there's usually more paintings and sculptures. I kind of noticed maybe actually a little bit later than paintings, but I don't really have an explanation why that was. Um, but yeah, I hope I answered your question there. I'm wondering, though, because there's so much influence in Europe when it comes to art of any form, mm. who you were admiring then when you were a child and you, and you were being taken? Was it your mother that would take you around the galleries and museums? Yeah, 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 absolutely. My dad is also interested in it. Like, he was coming with us as well, but he um, wouldn't be the creative one. He was always saying, I can't even draw a stick figure. But um, so, uh, yeah, like, well, who I was... I really um, enjoyed um, Monet and Mani and like a lot of um, impressionists and expressionists as well. It was, I was more captured to, I think, more the emotions in the artworks than, of course, I think that's, that's the main thing, what it has with art, than maybe the technique. Like there is amazing, amazing um, paintings in the Renaissance as well and, and beforehand. And of course, I started to appreciate, I, I appreciated them from the beginning. And then you start appreciating them even more when you can put them in context of the time and um, how revolutional these paintings were. But for me, I felt more drawn to something I could emotionally connect with than maybe pre because for some periods of time, you need to have certain amount of, um, history knowledge or like even mythological knowledge to understand an artwork or to make make it even more impactful but i feel like with um certain painters also van gogh and like uh, the, the painters out of that century there doesn't have to be that knowledge um which as a child i didn't have um to understand the artwork on an emotional level i hope that i hope that makes sense <laughs> It's interesting you mentioned the mythological background too, because I'm sure that is helpful when it comes to sculpturing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, suddenly, when you like see um, now, now I'm blanking on all the names, but uh, yeah, like when you see a lot of a lot of sculptures um, from even the Renaissance or even like the Rape of the Sabiner, Sir David, um, like all all these kind of sculptures, there is a story behind it, um, and then I think that adds to the work as well to I'm going to pick out, yeah, the most famous one, the David, like when you know what he was going into um, to beat Goliath, like, you know, the whole background. So you can see much more and you can have a bigger interpretation into his gaze um, and ant anticipation. So, yeah, I think um, with time and with, yeah, learning about 
those those stories um it just added to the artworks when you when you view them mm. but yeah and then there is Rodin and Camille Trudel where there again there is potentially sometimes some stories but most of the time I I really love their works because it's also again on a very purely emotional um connection it's um yeah for me at least when I view them there is something really human about it um, and the struggle of humanity. And of course, there is some stories as well um, around it, but it just shows, even if you wouldn't know the story, I feel like there, there, yeah, there is so much emotion captured in it. Um, so I feel really drawn. I felt also, yeah, as a child, really drawn to these kind of works. Were there any female sculptors out there that, uh, you know, you were admiring? I mean, uh, you think of those that are past, of course, like Camille Claudel, I'm sure you've seen that movie. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but in terms of the modern day sculptors, were there any women whose work you were admiring and aspiring to follow? For well, I feel like um, for me, well, in my, like I'm still quite young, um, and in my generation, kind of Instagram was starting to. To become a thing. Um, although I have been a little bit late to that game, I feel like for my generation even. So when I came to the academy, it was like the first time that I actually kind of got an Instagram account to see who's all out there um, on that kind of like figurative um, world. And then of course, names um, of sculptors and painters like sculptors Modi Brady um who's been who's an Australian sculptor who's still an instructor at the Florence Academy of Art as well and um then there was a lot of um female painters coming up and more and more the more you kind of open into uh, the yeah like the more you tap into Instagram and the art field because I feel like for figurative sculptures even if you go to exhibitions and museums what I said before a little bit nowadays, like it is a bit of a niche and um, it is not the most common thing that you stumble into a museum and there's going to be a lot of figurative female sculptors in there. Um, so actually I kind of got to know those sculptors much, like much, much later when I actually started or wanted to start my own sculpting career, I got introduced to those, but beforehand I didn't really have, have a big um, knowledge of like contemporary figurative sculptors, um, female figurative sculptors. Um, so yeah, that kind of happened when I when I started studying at the academy. Well, let's go back to Austria for a moment, if I may, Jana. And, yeah. and as a child growing up there, what was that like for you? What sort of interests did you have in, in childhood? It was uh, very very nice. Um, it, well, I was born in Salzburg and then I stayed there for um, like three years. My family then moved right across the border to, to Germany. So then, but that doesn't really make a, make a big difference because as I said before, it was so close. Um, it was really nice. It was a very, I think, um, safe childhood. Like I grew up on a small village Um close, yeah, close to, close to Salzburg and not in a big city or anything. So there was a lot of nature around. We have a lot of, um, mountains, like we're really close to the Alps. We have a lot of lakes. So, um, it was a very calm, um, upbringing, I think. And then of course I had these wonderful opportunities to kind of explore my creativity in all kinds of things. Like, as I mentioned at the beginning a little bit, I had a lot of what you call hobbies, um, like, yeah, going and like different kinds of dancing, playing violin, playing the piano. Um, on one hand, like it was really, really yeah, nice and uh, calm. On the other hand, I'm, it's when you, when you grow up on a small village and you are not born and your family is not from there, I think, um, it can be sometimes a little bit interesting how people who have been born and raised there will start, um, kind of looking at you as a foreigner, which, um, yeah, was a, sometimes then a little bit tough because 
of all the traditions around um, Bavaria, especially when you like look, there's a lot of um, orchestras where they play like the trumpet and um, it's it's like very folks music. And then, of course, I was the one who's playing the violin and the piano who might have not fit in perfectly into that framework. So on that part, it was a little bit, um, yeah, interesting as a as a child and actually now as an adult as well, looking at that and being surprised how people even react towards yeah, just um, people who haven't been born and raised exactly in the same spot and stayed there, which I think is a little bit of a shame. Um, but of course, I also had wonderful, yeah, wonderful friends and wonderful um, people around me. But it's just something when I look back on it where I'm like, hmm. I don't know if, uh, yeah, if I would want to live that rule, um, again for my, for my future life, but you never know. Many people come back to where they were born and raised. So we'll see. But for now, I feel like I'm a bit more comfortable on the, um, yeah, Florence is still a small city in Salzburg as well, but a little bit more central to where more people are around. Um, yeah. So given all those cultural influences and your parents obviously encouraging you with your artwork, you said it was not until you were a teenager that you had a sense of where you really wanted to go because you had wonderful um, education when you did decide it was going to be art. So what was that sort of period like as a teenager, making those big decisions, those life-changing decisions as, as to the direction you wanted to take with your art? Yeah, um, well... I was always kind of embraced into art school. Like I was like, um, yeah, going to art schools. And then I went first to a gymnasium, which was also focusing on arts. So that was, but that was more into the general arts of dancing, music, theater, literature, and then fine art. And then after four years, there's an option to change schools. And that was already the first thing where I was then going and saying, okay, I'll, I'll focus on going on into a sculpting school. Um, because it seemed like I had a natural kind of inclination in to more like the fine arts region and then sculpting. Like, yeah, sculpting surrounding, but of course, when you, I was 14 at that time. Um, so I wasn't a hundred percent sure what my future is going to look like. And then when I went to the sculpting school, as I, as I mentioned, we did a lot of, um, yeah, different materials. And, uh, then of course you, uh, yeah, for some people, it's been always really, really clear what their future is going to be like. But I actually, when I graduated from that school and I, I, I met the right people, I think, um, at the right time. It's, I think it's nearly like, yeah, if you want to call it faith. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've done, I've done an internship with another sculptor, um, Audal de Joana, and, um, he kind of opened up the, the figurative world for me. And he used to be an instructor at the academy as well. So he kind of was like, Oh, there's the Florence Academy of Art, which you might be, might be interested in to enrolling because I can see you really are kind of enjoying and always now doing realistic portraits mainly at that time. Um, so he kind of introduced me to, to that school. And, um, at that point, I wasn't even a hundred percent sure if, um, yeah, if I, if I, can make it because of course it's like, it's a private school as well. Um, it costs, um, quite a good tuition, which I know in the States that's, that's totally normal in Europe. Usually education is for free. So of course that was one thing as well. Um, so I actually decided to, um, go and travel New Zealand for a year to kind of figure out what I want to do with, um, with my life in a way. So, um, and then there, of course, traveling with an armature and traveling with clay as a backpacker wasn't really an option. So that really made me miss sculpture a lot. So I think that was one of the things where I was like, okay, this is something which I really want to pursue. Um, and there, the only options I had was like drawing a little bit and writing a little bit. But then, yeah, I actually ended up making one sculpture there because I really, really missed it. So I kind of bought some clay, made myself a wooden armature and made like a very, um, yeah, made just like a very rough portrait. But, um, yeah, after that, I kind of knew because I missed it that I would want to pursue, um, that career. And when I came back from, well, I still enrolled while I was in New Zealand to the Florence Academy of Art to see if I get, like I applied for it to get accepted. And when I got accepted, I, 
yeah, I had some time still in Germany. I did some random jobs, waitressing and these kind of things to, to get some money. And, um, yeah, then, then moved, moved over to Florence to start my education there. So, yeah. So going to such an, a prestigious academy as the Florence Academy of Art, was that something that, you know, was intimidating in some way or did you feel confident that this is absolutely what I want to do and uh, and you went into it, you know, with enthusiasm and, and a confidence that this is this is the direction you're going in now? I was pretty, by then I was pretty sure that this is what I wanted to do. Um, since I think I had this this time to kind of evaluate and think about what I wanted to do. And um, of course the Florence Academy of Art, well, has a, I think in the, in the fine art world has a pretty big name for the academies um, around, I think even the world, let's say. Um, but I, yeah, I knew that when I, like I was, when I, when I went there, I was sure this is going to be the path I, I'm, I want to take. And of course there could be, like I could have still changed my mind, but I was like 99% on it that I was like, okay, this, this is going to be it from day one on. Um, yeah. And so how old were you then when you were, went to Florence? I was uh, 19 when I went to Florence. Yeah. I'm curious what you took with you from New Zealand. What were your takeaways from that year down under? I think mainly my takeaways might have not been super artistic. They might have been more into being independent and um, because I was traveling by myself um, and also how to maybe, um, yeah, connect with other people or like meet new people and kind of even going a little bit outside of my comfort zone occasionally. And um, just, yeah, I think it made me stand a little bit more on my own feet um, because of course, when you travel by yourself, I still like, I loved that time I was there. Um, and I think I had my highest, like, yeah, like uh, really high ups and really high downs as well. Uh, low downs, high downs would have been interesting. Um, but um, yeah, I think I had a lot of roller coaster times, but I, I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't miss a second of it. And I think that really made me, yeah, um, appreciate life and also just, yeah, just be, to just see that everything is going to be okay. And that, um, yeah, that I can, that I can make it in a way, um, by myself and just probably gave me a little bit of self-confidence as well to kind of, even if the times are sometimes like meh, <laughs> it will, it will, will be fine. Um, so yeah, I think that's mainly what I took out of it. And then of course there's been like a lot of, um, just like input on what I, what I saw, like the nature over there is just absolutely mind blowing. It's really, really beautiful. And, um, yeah. So I think that's, that's that. In, in addition to that, of course, you managed to polish your English. So how many languages do you speak now? Well, fluent, fluent, fluently three. Uh, my Italian um, should be better after the time I've spent there. I understand it well and I can speak without conjugating my verbs correctly. Um, but I can get around um, quite well. But since um, I've mentioned this to you a little bit before, but the the bubble we are in is English speaking at the academy. Um, everybody speaks English. And then even when you're in, like you're instructing in English and then my Italian picked up after I, I graduated and then I needed to kind of talk with potential clients or I needed to go to the foundry um, to get my bronzes done. And like, there is just a different generation who works there who's, who doesn't speak really English. So I needed to then pick up on my, my Italian. Um, and yeah, so fluently, yeah, Czech, German and English. English and then Italian, but that could have been, that still can be improved. Well, there's plenty of time, plenty of yeah. time. Uh -huh. And you mentioned at the school, you you were influenced by Eduardo Juana um, Gores, and, and there, I'm sure were other teachers there. Talk a little bit about those early influences from the teachers that you had. 
Yeah, there have been, um, well, as I mentioned before, there's been Maudie Brady, who was a student at the academy, but then she left as well um, and came back as an instructor a couple of years later and also then was one of my instructors. But the first person, I think, um, who founded the program as well at the academy was uh, Robert Bowden, who now is running a studio in Athens. He unfortunately left the academy quite early after I um, enrolled because he wanted to open his own studio in Athens. Um, But he was like just a really, yeah, um, yeah, like inspiring person to me and also very good and gentle director. Like he was a really great teacher. And then he was also just a really great human to go to if there's anything you're struggling with, but uh, as a, like struggling with, with your sculpture, even if there's some doubts on, on the arts and these kind of things. So he was always very, very had an open, open ear. So you could always knock at a studio and, and come and have a chat. So that was really nice. And then, yeah. Um, art wise, like artwork wise at, at the Academy, it's, very um well they focus a lot on on just learning a technique um so for me then it's and it's i think that's something very beneficial as well to really get the technique and then afterwards you can explore whatever you want um so you have the skill and the craft to make art afterwards because for me um for me, there's a difference between learning the craft and then actually making making art. Um, so yeah, at the academy, it was mainly working the craft. So I feel I've always felt more inspired from the people who then actually were ma- making in my head art with it. So something which had a message as well, um, and that was mainly then influenced from outside of the academy, um, from people who already graduated or who've been um, having an artistic career by themselves. Um, so yeah. So what kind of styles then were inspiring you? Still very figurative, but, uh, so there has been from, from painters, um, there have been Colm Barry, who is still a figurative painter, but she, um, really puts a lot of, yeah, like for me, meaningful messages. She's, um, putting a lot of like, um, how do you say, like uh, the relationship between mother and child um, on her paintings. And she just kind of uses color and just um, kind of uses symbolism in some ways to kind of get an emotion across. So I think these kind of works were always a little bit more um, powerful to me. It's a, it's a similar thing what I had, I think, in my childhood that I felt always more drawn to not the technically perfect things, but more to the emotional things. Like I, I, by now, I, like if something is a little bit wank with purport, like if there's a little bit of a too long of a leg or if there is um, something which anatomically might not be fully correct, but it's for the benefit of the artwork, I would always feel more drawn to that. And I, also in my own work, I always go more into, okay, maybe the ribcage can't really do this, but it will be better to show the emotion I want. And it will be also better for the artwork itself regarding composition, for example. So it's been always more, it's still figurative, but it's more, yeah, like having, having a message and an emotion behind it. And at what point then were you starting to sell your work and realizing that you could make a, a living out of this? Well, I, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a, when it comes to, yeah, to my, to my work and I probably also a little bit to my, yeah, passion here. I, I like to have things planned out, um, a little bit. So I was trying to already while I was enrolling at the academy, I was trying to organize my own exhibitions with, with my works. I made, um, a side project at the academy because of course the curriculum at the beginning doesn't give you nice artworks and it's as I said it's studies Um, so we did like a lot of David features and then we made a skull and then we started with our first portrait but all these works have been really my artworks um it's been more studies but i've i've always made some on on the saturdays and sundays i've always went into the academy and did my personal works um which i felt more connected to and so i by the end of my first year i at least made a i don't know i can't really remember fully but seven works um which i felt like i could show 
in an exhibition. And then I've tried to organize um, smaller shows around my neighborhood in Germany. So I was going to Salzburg to see if there's any kind of... Um, I don't know what the English word is properly for this, but cultural rooms, um, like that, with the lack of a better word, like places where you can just expose um, your work for free and it's not a gallery, it's more like an event room. So I was trying to find these rooms and I was lucky to find um, every year since um, seven years, I've been repeating this with uh, my best friend. She's a painter and an illustrator. And we've been repeating this exhibition since my first year at the academy as well that I've been trying to expose somewhere because I knew that um, I needed to like I knew for myself pretty early on that I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to sustain myself from my artwork so I ne needed to put that work in and get my name out there somehow so so I can live off this in the end as well so I was starting to sell here and there very briefly um, in my first year but I, I think I can count on one hand how many works I've sold um, and then I've been, yeah, repeating kind of these shows every year. And then I was starting when I felt a bit more confident into applying into competitions um, in London and Barcelona, um, in New York, and trying to like get my get my works exposed in in group shows as well. And so, um, yeah, then it has slowly been picking up um, here and there. But it, yeah, of course, it, it takes time. It takes time, and it takes the it takes people who are interested in 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 these kind of works and of course i also realized a big change of um when i graduated from the academy that i could really do fully fully committed the works i suddenly had more or less the skill set to do exactly what i wanted to do um with full figures because at the beginning i was really interested in portraiture and i think i still love portraiture it's a something where you can explore a lot of emotions and show a lot of emotions but um, I also think that when I was in my first year, that was a field where I felt most comfortable in because I didn't really know how to sculpt the figure yet properly. Um, so after I kind of started to learn how to sculpt the figure, I kind of immediately swapped into into figure. I was, uh, yeah, that for me right now, that's a much more um, broad field where I can explore much more emotions than only with a portrait. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> So how much of your time then would be spent not sculpting? Your artistic time is it, uh, on paper, on canvas. Do you do you sketch? Do you do a lot of figurative work uh, in, in that sense? Does that help you with the sculpting? Most of the time I, I'm, I'm sculpting. I do also when I sketch, I do sketches in, in plastiline or in clay. Um I, yeah, I, my, 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 my life is based in my studio more or less. Um, and when I, when I can't sculpt, I, I do sketch here and there. Um, but I still feel like I can understand, um, the composition the best when I have it three dimensional in front of me. So it works all, um, yeah, all 360. And I, yeah, when I sketch, I'm not really confident in my sketching. I think I could also still learn a lot how to make anatomically nice sketches and these kind of things, which they maybe don't have to be, but I feel like I still have this little voice that, and that's my, maybe something from the academy still, where it's like everything has to be like perfect when you do it and it doesn't have to be, but um, there's still like this small thing where I'm like, okay, I can just freely sketch maybe, but I just feel a little bit still not a hundred percent confident with my, with my pure sketching, but I actually, when I'm not in the studio, which when I have holidays, um, I try to watercolor. It's a very armature watercoloring and I would like, I'm planning to take a workshop, um, at some point as well. Um, but, um, this is something I kind of, if I can't have clay, um, I will try to watercolor a little bit. Um, so yeah. How many commissions then would you now get, Jana? I mean, in terms of a, a, the, a period of a year, yeah. What, you know, what, what does that look like for you in terms of com you know the commission versus the non-commissioned work that you're putting in shows? Yeah, um, there is mainly no commission works um, since I'm actually I yeah I feel actually quite lucky in that way that I can sustain myself with my personal work mainly. I've done this year. I've done one commission. Um, but I'm also just um, quite picky potentially when it comes to commissions. Um, of course, there is like 
perfect commissions where somebody says, I want a female figure and you're free to go. Um, and then I'd be the first person who jumps on a commission like this. Um, but I think that's quite rare. And I just realized with the commission I've, commissions I've made, um, they've been nice and it's been a nice experience, but also it's something where I feel like it's not really me. It's not really my idea. It's not really what I would like to express. And of course it always depends on the framework of the commission. Like, as I said, like some people are like super, super free and they tell you we want roughly this and then you can put your own imagination into it. But I, I felt like I never really had that exact commission where I was like, okay, this is something where I can still explore my creative freedom in it. So I've been, um, yeah, and yeah, as I said, with the commissions I've had, I've I've made them, but I could realize while making them that it's some kind of pressure coming and I didn't enjoy it as much as doing my own work. And of course, I have quite high expectations to myself when I make my work. Um, but then when there's somebody outside and you're not sure how they're going to like it. And it just puts some kind of um, pressure on me, which I never really enjoyed. So I've been kind of stepping out of commission um, or trying to avoid commissions um, as much as I can, depending of course on the commission. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So mainly, mainly my personal works have been made this year. So what are the origins of your personal work, work then? And do you know where they're going to go when you start them? No, they don't really have a, they don't really, like, they don't have a destiny where they're going to be exposed or where they're going to go. They more have, like, I have my ground idea and I know how, um, it should end more or less. Like, of course, there is always a bit of a, um, yeah, wiggle room how it actually ends in the end. But, um, usually I kind of know what I want to express or what I want to show. Um, that's also why I make those pre studies and, um, just, see what the composition is like because when I go into a project some people are super free and just go and they say okay we'll see what comes out of it but for me I kind of need this um, idea I want to explore um, to actually get me started on something um, because in the end I yeah I need to have a bit of a of a plan how this how I want to express this mainly emotions or or situations um so they, yeah, they always are a little bit more planned than um, very like spontaneous. Um, since it's also really big projects, like in the end um, with sculpture, I think it might also be part why I might not take that many commissions. Com- like back in the days, of course, the sculptures were even bigger than what we what I'm doing now, no doubt. But and took much much longer. But if I work on a sculpture which is life size, it's going to take me. Um, up to, yeah, like 10 weeks, like two months, three months, sometimes depending how much things are coming in between, how many other things are there to handle. Um, and so that's actually quite a, like, it's not super, super long, but it's quite long compared to maybe, um, a, I don't know, a smaller painting or something or, um, yeah. So it's like a lot of time spent on one project. Um, so I need to kind of see, okay, where is this going? Um, and since I'm working with life models as well, um, I kind of need to know a little bit, um, what I want to do with it since then I have a model posing for me, um, daily. Um, so yeah. That's a huge project and not inexpensive either, but you said you have, um, you know, the wherewithal to do this without having to, um, take commissions for a livelihood. So how does that work in terms of your business model? So, um, of course, it's like an investment to just start your own projects. And I'm just so every time I'm hoping that somebody will buy it and see something in it and uh, wants to have the sculpture around. Um, so it's a little bit of a risk, which I have to knock on wood has worked out so far, more or less. Um, but also I've I'm occasionally teaching um, courses, which gives me a little bit of an income. I'm mainly like I'm kind of doing them two or three times a year, depending on the year. Um, and on the, um, yeah, opportunities. Sometimes I teach those courses, um, at the studio in Florence, um, which I'm sharing with two other sculptors. Um, 
So we teach the workshops there in pairs of two sometimes. And then occasionally I get an offer to teach a workshop abroad from another fine art um, academy. So going to Amsterdam, going, well, I was supposed to go to, um, to Russia, but that um, obviously didn't, didn't work out then. But so yeah, there's like occasional courses, which give me a little bit of a, like also a nice break from a very, very, um, long routine. Like I really try to stick to my routines. Um, and it's nice to meet new people. Actually, it's also very inspiring to see how people learn and how you can, um, still learn from them as well. And I think rephrasing something kind of makes you understand as well what you might want to change or apply in your own work again. And it just, um, kind of is a fresh breath, um, teaching those courses. So that's been, um, also, of course, um, business wise helping out. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to mainly yeah sell my work and, um, going into exhibitions and trying to, to get them, um, out there as much as possible, like get them seen. I know you've got quite the list on your website, but uh, pick out some of those, uh, what you would consider your highlights. Oh, and my highlights. Oh, there, well, there's uh, one in a permanent collection in a museum in Barcelona, which I think is uh, one of my highlights to be able to be shown in a museum. Um, so that, and then there has been an exhibition in Paris, which I think was really wonderful as well, where um, I've got an opportunity to work with a foundry and get a, um, there was like an, a price as well to then work with a foundry and they were making a, a bronze statue for free. Um, so that was really great. And then I'm having a solo exhibition coming up in Lisbon, um, in January as well. Um, and yeah, another, like another gallery, of course, like then in Florence. And, um, so it's in Europe a little bit all around exhibition wise in London, there's an ex, um, uh, yeah, exhibition I'm, um, applying to nearly every year. It's called the face exhibition, um, which is mainly on like small figures and portraiture. So yeah. Um, and then, as I said, trying to, yeah, put, put my own shows together then in Salzburg mainly and, uh, and in Munich. And so how, how long a day would you spend then in the studio sculpting? Um, depending on, um, what, if I, if I have time to only sculpt or if I have to go to the foundry, for example, I think my, my usual working days are up to, well, 10 hours and then, I will work usually until Sunday. Sunday, I'm trying to keep my day open and, and off fully. Unfortunately, at the moment, it doesn't fully work out because it's before Christmas. And then um, also Sunday is ending up to be my, my computer day, unfortunately. But I kind of want to change that again. Um, but yeah, usually in the studio, 10, 10 hours, 10 to 11 hours a day from Monday till Saturday. And then whatever is coming up. So there's um, either like I usually have every morning my model session, which I'm trying to keep in no matter what. It's kind of a routine where I'm like, I, I don't want to skip this for any other thing, no matter how much work there is. I need to have my three hours with a model. So usually from 8.30 until 11.30, I'm having a model who's posing for a project I'm working on um, at that time. And then in the afternoons, um, I would love to just be able to continue on that project and sculpting. But um, reality is I will have to go and usually either cast something, so make a copy of a work I've already done so I can send it to either a gallery or a client, um, or I have to go to the foundry to work on the waxes to make it into bronze. Um, or I will, um, yeah, patinate things, um, so like put a color on the sculptures. So usually that's kind of how, how the day um, is filled, but I'm trying to put more time again into just sculpting. So I've been trying to have somebody at least come in once or twice a week to help me out with the casting um, of the things because that's only um, kind of manual labor work. There's nothing, unfortunately, nothing really creative about it. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, like very routine work of, of making a copy of an already existing sculpture. So I've been trying to kind of balance balance that a little bit more into only being able to to sculpt or to draw. Um, but yeah, 
Well, it's very physical work, of course, being a sculptor. So I'm, I'm wondering what you do for fun to unwind and after a day in the studio. Well, I, I would love to do that even more. Um, but I, I've tried to go climbing, um, or at least bouldering, um, because in Florence, there's not a lot of higher mountains, although the Italians would say the Tuscany hills are high enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I do, I do a little bit of boulder. So sports really helps me and boulder, especially or climbing. Um, it really balances me out because suddenly you have to turn off your head, which for me, it's, most of the time running um, and then you just have to focus on how you use your body and how you use your strength to kind of manage a road to climb up so suddenly your your brain is totally focused on something entirely different um, and that really helps me to to just turn off um, and I think any kind of sports, although usually boulder or I'm biking from my studio back home, but that's just like on a routine, but I'm trying to, yeah, um, boulder mainly. And then if I'm not in Florence, I try to go outside and hike, um, in the mountains when I'm, when I'm back in Salzburg to just kind of go out in nature and, um, just have like peaceful, peace, peaceful or surrounding, um, and I, I would love to make time for it more than it's happening right now. But I also feel like at the beginning, when you, when you're starting to be independent and um, and try to run a business for yourself, it will need some of those, um, yeah, long days and long hours. But I think with time, you will learn and kind of figure out how to um, match everything, <laughs> like match work-life balance well. <laughs> exactly. Very important. Yeah. I wonder what life goals you have at this point there in terms of other museums and galleries that you would love to be shown in? Of course, there's a lot of museums I would love to be shown in. But uh, for now, I'm, well, for now, I'm kind of happy where where I am. And I just hope that this will continue to grow as it is that I will be able to yeah, be shown more um, in Paris or um, even more in New York or be able to work in a gallery in New York. Um, although I'm realizing that shipping over there is um, for a sculptor, a very um, expensive thing to do. Um, so I just, I really just want to be able to continue working um, as much as I do and maybe give away some, um, some work actually with the casting part at some point fully to, to just be able to focus on creating. Um, of course, yeah, there is um, my, well, my general goal is to more have um, works in public spaces. Um, of course, like it's nice to have works and like it's amazing to have works in galleries. No, no question and no, um, and also in museums. But I feel like still one thing which like is more would I, I would prefer is to really have something in an open space where everybody can see it. Since still for for galleries, maybe not. You don't have to pay for um, entering, but. For museums, usually you do have to pay some kind of entrance, so it's not visible for anybody and everybody. So, um, and when something is in the public space, of course, maybe there's a much bigger criticism because suddenly the whole society can see it. But I still think it's very interesting to be able to reach everyone, no matter if they can pay to enter a museum or a gallery. So that is something I would love to explore more, to have things more out in public. Um, but I hope that comes with time and um, I'm looking for different um, yeah, opportunities um, to, to be able to do that. What do you like to hear people say about your work? What, what's the biggest compliment and the greatest satisfaction? Oh, <laughs> I think for me, I think if they, yeah, if they feel something, if they say it, it, it moved me or, um, yeah, it, it made me think of something. It made me remind, it reminds me of, of something in their life potentially. Um, yeah, as I think that's one of the biggest compliments. Um, cause I, I feel like, and that's absolutely normal as well, because we come from like, I come from a very academic background, but when people say, Oh, this is, beautifully sculpted. I, I absolutely admire it as a compliment, no doubt, like any compliment I'm, I'm really happy about, but I feel like I, I feel more, oh, I, I feel like my work is more seen if somebody, 
yeah, I can feel something because that's my end goal with my work to to show an emotion or show a circumstance in life. Um, so I feel, yeah, I feel, yeah, seen when when somebody says um, something in in that frame around that frame that they, yeah, that they can feel an emotion with it. Well, here we are, twenty twenty four, a year ahead of us. What are you most looking forward to at this point, Jana? I think to yeah to starting my next project and uh, to the solo show which is coming up um and then just i'm really curious what's going to happen in this year what's going to come come next um there is a couple things lined up which i'm excited about, but i actually would love to make a trip to new york um it's been on my list for a while and i think 2024 should be the time i'll 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 go over there and um, and visit. Um, but yeah, I think just like the projects which are coming up, uh, really excited for like exciting for me to start working on. Well, the future is bright for sure. It's wonderful to watch your work, and I hope we see more of it over here in the states. But it's lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really really wonderful. If you scroll down the show notes that accompany this episode, you can find a link to Jana's website with some beautiful examples of her work. I highly recommend you stop buying. Take a look around her website. And you can also follow her on Instagram. We'll have a link to that too. And don't forget, whilst you're on Instagram, do give us a follow at The Art Podcast. That's The Art with two A's. We would love to hear from you then. If you would like to leave a comment or question, Maybe a suggestion for guests, and you can also message us there, of course, as well as leave your comments. And also, you can reach us by email at hollowellstudios at gmail.com. And if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, then please do take a moment to leave us a five-star rating and a review, because that helps others find the show. And a reminder that this show is weekly, and it drops every Tuesday morning at 5.30 a.m. Eastern. So if you subscribe, uh, you'll get an automatic download when you open your podcast app. Coming up on the show, we're going to be hearing from the German illustrator Julia Bankert and the British TV and film makeup artist Kerry September. I'll be back next week, so I do hope you'll join me then. (music) 